so much for tuning in. Welcome, welcome to our um, welcome to our panel entitled "Building Peace Through Cooperative, Inclusive, and Sustainable Climate Security Practices." My name is Jeff DeBelco. I'm um, a professor at Ohio University at the Boinovich School of Leadership and Public Service. Uh, work as a senior advisor of the Wilson Center's Environmental Change and Security Program, and I'm proud in this context to be a founding member <clears throat> of the Environmental Peacebuilding Association. So it's a thrill to be welcoming you all uh, to this forum, a, a, a really exciting one with the content that we have um, for today. So um, I'll just start off by saying uh, we encourage all of you who are tuning in to drop in your name, your affiliation, maybe a word or two about how you connect to these issues. It is one that's always um, uh, a great opportunity to learn from each other. And so we'd like you to introduce yourselves if you could do that in that fashion. It's also a place where you can drop in a question as we go. Um, we have a rich set of speakers and that will be an opportunity for you to to um, share those insights there along the way. And our panelists may respond to you in text or we'll try to get through the questions. So for this panel at the heart of it is really about getting on with responding to climate security links, environmental peace building, moving beyond threat identification and looking for responses uh, to threats and but also capturing opportunities that come through response. We want this panel to speak to both scholars and practitioners, and we hope the ideas and initiatives discussed today will be thought-provoking fodder for all of you to push forward with ambitious and innovative approaches in a range of contexts, diverse set of actors, utilizing a variety of tools and methods, and bringing efforts to scale and beyond just the pilot approaches that are um, still relatively uh, common in, in, this, in this field, in this area. Our panelists are also, I should note, making explicit connections between the climate and security arena and the environmental peace building approach. And for some that may seem quite logical and, and inseparable, um, but as somebody working in this space for a long time, that hasn't always been the case. And so I think this is a real positive sign that these um, dialogues and discourses are coming together in really meaningful ways that uh, I think give us some practical ways forward and give us a sense of what people are already doing. We have a very experienced panel, wide range of insights, and they will share those in kind of two rounds of questions that we have posed for each of them. Um, then we'll have a Q&A. Uh, we, like I said, encourage you to drop those questions into the chat so that we have an opportunity to integrate your queries um, into their answers and into responses that we give. Um, so I'm just going to very briefly introduce them up front and then we'll just kind of stick with the flow of the conversation. We're gonna go first in the order that they're listed in the program. And that is to start with uh, Lucas Rudiger, who's a senior advisor at Adelphi in, in Berlin, German, Germany, long time uh, player in this space. Uh, Gidon Bromberg, also uh, very experienced, and I can say that for all of these folks. He's the co-director of EcoPeace Middle East. Um, Marika Peters, who is a senior peace and conflict advisor, the European External Action Service, the EU. Uh, Louis Van Schek is the head of the EU and Global Affairs Unit at Klingendahl Institute, um, and uh, one that we've benefited from their, their work now for many years as well. And finally, Gabriela Menea is the principal program manager at DCAF, Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance in Switzerland. And I thank them all for all their efforts in putting this panel together and the work that they're going to, to share with us. So just to jump in then for a first round of questions, um, and uh, Lucas, I'll throw it to you after kind of stating these, which is you know, kind of despite the widespread perception of climate change as a multiplier risk and a potential trigger violence where we've seen a lot of focus, a lot of attention, rightfully, but um, to go beyond that a bit, why uh, and how uh, should, could climate related security risks represent opportunities for environmental peace building from the perspective and experiences on the ground from, from your work? Um, and the work of Adelphi? And then what are concrete examples of cooperative, inclusive, and or sustainable, hopefully all three, climate security practices within the context of action um, from, from your experience? And I'll have all the panelists address that, starting with Lucas and going to Gadon, um, and then we'll uh, come back for a second round of questions. So Lucas, if I could throw it to you. 
Great, uh, thanks, Geoff. And uh, also, um, hello from my side. I'm, I'm also very, very happy to be here. I try to tackle the question a little bit or parts of the question, and um, I'll focus on maybe on one particular area that that we at Adelphi have been working on um, for a long time, for at least 15 years, and that's the kind of the better analysis of environment and climate-related security risks. So, so currently we. We're condensing a lot of the knowledge um, that we have in an initiative that's called Weathering Risk, where we have developed a, a new methodology and approach. Um, it's new methodology, but it's building on um, our experiences, but also kind of a lot of the experiences in the space of environmental peace building and climate security. And we are piloting it around the world. And I won't go into detail about the methodology. Um, if you're interested, there's another session tomorrow There will be part of, um, and I can drop a link in, in the chat later. Um, but I want to focus really on just one um, specific um, key lesson learned that um, really I think is um, is at the heart of any any good climate security analysis, um, and that is to combine quantitative climate and environmental data, for example, projections on temperature, um, projections on um, precipitation changes, other quantitative environmental data like deforestation rates, um, soil degradation, with on the other hand locally led and informed qualitative research and that research should be as inclusive as possible so the way we do that is we normally partner with organizations or individuals that are very familiar and in the best case from a specific uh, country or region we work in and they do as many in-depth interviews with as many representatives from different groups as possible um, and we'll like kind of look for not only ethnic representation but focus um, also, especially on those groups that are marginalized and are normally not part of these kind of exercises and research um, because um, they're normally excluded because of age, gender, or other reasons. And then um, I'll quickly talk about three examples um, of what kind of results you get when you combine these kind of two things. Um, one is around Lake Chad. So that's um, a lake that is shared between Nigeria, Niger, Cameroon, and Chad. Um, and there's a very common climate security narrative that Lake Chad is shrinking, um, and that is creating more scarcity, and that is creating more conflicts around natural, resource, natural resources. Um, and this is also a perception that is often shared by governments in the region, and also people who live around the lake. Um, but what we found um, when we um, carefully um, analyzed kind of remote sensing and satellite data that we had to use because ground-based observations um, are not possible at the moment and were not possible for the past 10 years because of the ongoing flow. Um, conflict that the lake as is in fact not shrinking. Um, and the problem is that we have increasing variability. So we have years with a lot of rain and years with little rain. And that the conflict has led to a situation where it is very hard for local population groups to cope with that variability. And that's kind of a very different thing of saying the lake is shrinking and that leads you to very different approaches and also solutions to that problem. Um, the second example is, um, and we're just finalizing an assessment of Mali. And here, also when people talk about climate security risks in Mali, they often talk about farmer herder conflicts. But um, what we found when we talked to farmer herders, but all kinds of other people also in Mali, um, that the situation is much more complex. And um, all kinds of different groups are adapting to climate change and conflict in many different ways. And that is contributing to more conflicts and less resilience um, in many different ways. For example, people are actually diversifying their livelihoods. So farmers are also um, doing livestock herding, you know, also doing fishing. Um, and that seems to be um, at first sight good. But what we also saw is that that is actually decreasing cooperation between these different groups and actually decreasing social cohesion between groups. So that's kind of like one, one interesting finding there. And then um, last example is in Colombia, um, we looked together with WF and the Fundacion Ideas para Paz at how and why in the aftermath of the peace agreement with the FARC, deforestation rates and murders of environmental defenders um, increase. Um, and um, as these kind of examples show, um, they're really, very context specific and very different ways that environment, climate change and conflict are related. Um, and they also show that it is super important to use an approach 
that is locally informed and inclusive because you miss these specificities. Um, but if you have a crime and security assessment that is locally informed and inclusive, there is really an opportunity um, for better analysis, for deeper understanding of the context, and then also better programming um, based on such um, a deep analysis. And with that, I would like to hand over back to you, Jeff. Thank you very much, uh, Lucas. It's both um, how to do it and then some examples of what the benefits of those approaches have, have, have gotten. Um, get on, you have um, a, a quite a few lessons learned from doing things on the ground, so to speak. Um, why don't we throw it to you? So thank you, Jeff. And again, thank you for the organizers for the opportunity to participate in this esteemed panel. Um, so at Ecopeace Middle East, you know, we're, we're Palestinians, Jordanians, and Israelis working together. And we've been doing this for close to 30 years. Um, perhaps uh, uh, developing on the ground environmental peace building before the concept even existed. Now, you know, climate security, climate crisis, uh, we've identified that as a uh, certainly a threat, but but also very much as an opportunity, and the opportunity that the climate uh, crisis unfortunately uh, presents to our region is a new sense of urgency that perhaps uh, has been missing for some time in uh, peace building, certainly Israel Palestine but also in, in the broader uh, region. Um, and that sense of urgency uh, has broad consensus. So you know, the MENA region is the most water scarce part of the world. And the climate crisis um, is something that's not in dispute here. In fact, you know, while the rest of the world is worried about a, and quite rightly, a one and a half or two degree increase in temperatures, there's consensus here that we've already had a one and a half to two degree increase in temperatures. In, in fact, the Mediterranean Sea, the Eastern Mediterranean was two degrees higher last summer than ever recorded. And you know, we're seeing uh, loss of rainfall of precipitation. Uh, by the middle of the century, we can expect no rainfall in the autumn months. It, it already doesn't rain for the long summer period. It's another three months, two, three months of rainfall lost, uh, uh, perhaps a 40% reduction in precipitation. So that's sort, of, that's sort of data that's not disputed, that is agreed to by you know, Israeli, Palestinian, Jordanian, water officials, um, uh, governments, uh, is a springboard for uh, uh, not only introducing you know, that information, but uh, of changing attitudes and then changing behavior. And to capitalize on that, at Ecopeace Middle East, we released a new report just a year ago, just over a year ago, um, really built on the uh, uh, leadership of, of the European Union and the uh, European Green Deal. And, and we launched a report calling for a green blue deal for the Middle East as an NGO call, but nevertheless a, a 26 page document um, that emphasizes the water crisis in the center of it and comes uh, forward with four pillars, four solutions that, that we've proposed, put on the table that, that we think because of the climate crisis, there's a new sense of urgency that this, these issues can no longer wait. Um, the first pillar that we, that we uh, spoke about was sort of, again, learning from Europe on coal and steel. And we asked the question, well, well what's the coal and steel that's relevant to the Levant uh, uh, in the midst of a climate crisis. And we identified uh, 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 you know, large scale renewable energy and uh, uh, desalination powered by renewable energy, uh, both as a mitigation and adaptation measure. And uh, quite amazingly, within six months, uh, the governments of uh, Jordan and Israel actually signed a declaration of intent um, uh, uh, a game-changing agreement of potentially a $7 billion investment program to produce water security and energy security based on renewables uh, for the two countries. Um, our vision included Palestine from the outset. We're still hopeful 
um, uh, uh, that, that Palestine will also be able to come on board. Um, but uh, we have three other pillars of, uh, of that Green Blue Deal call, um, including the rehabilitation of the Jordan River, uh, you know, a river wholly to half of humanity that the conflict has uh, left little more than a sewage canal. But now, perhaps through the movement of the sale of water from the Mediterranean East, we can use the Jordan River as the regional water carrier and, and help rehabilitate it um, as a climate adaptation measure. Um, move forward on uh, Israeli-Palestinian water issues, and in, in particular advancing Palestinian water rights as something that have been held hostage to a political process of, of, of either moving forward on sort of all final status issues of Israeli-Palestinian peace or not moving forward on anything. Well, the climate crisis highlights that we can't afford to wait on water issues and, 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 and particularly on uh, water resilience for Palestinians, which has security implications for Israelis too. Um, and then finally, but, 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 but not least, the importance of mainstreaming uh, water diplomacy issues and, and, uh, and further uh, knowledge on the climate crisis in our education system so that we continue to uh, build a constituency of informed people. We're proud at Ecopeace that we've helped uh, you know, bring to the stage young Palestinian, Jordanian and Israeli Gretas, young youth that are really being outstanding and calling on our respective governments that the climate crisis means that these issues cannot wait. And I think that's the, that's the real opportunity here. It's the urgency um, uh, uh, of the climate crisis that are forcing the governments um, to move forward, to reconsider uh, uh, policies and old political paradigms that are in the way uh, for the very survival of our peoples in the Middle East. Thanks, Jim. Thank you so much, Gidon. Um, that's terrific. And um, it's, it's uh, with, with Lucas, we had the kind of uh, applied research and work, working in partnership with folks in the community and bringing data into the decisions. With Gidon, a kind of NGO leading, working with governments. And so now we're going to turn to Mariko, who um, with the EU and the institutional approach can help us understand how she's coming to these issues and in some ways what she needs as a practitioner from all of us in terms of helping her uh, advance these things from that perspective. Well, thank you very much. And, and also from my side, I'm very uh, grateful to be here and happy to meet you all. And I see also for you the chat, um, um, what great participants we have today. Um, so indeed, I am with the European Union the External Action Service, which represents the, let's say, the foreign affairs part of the EU outside the EU. And as an EU, we are bound to seize any opportunity for environmental peace building that is built into our DNA. And nowadays, every international forum, the EU not only, but also the AU, the OSCE and the UN, have by now recognized the link between climate and security and environment and the need to address it. Environmental peace building is now also um, um, within my external action service elevated as uh, one of our priorities in our mediation notes, in our climate and security notes. Later in the chat, I'll put a link to some of these uh, public policy documents that give you an idea of how the EU wants to go about it. Um, and in addition, in most fragile and conflict affected places hit by environmental degradation and climate change, the European Commission, the technical part of the EU, is the largest development partner. And since this year, 35% of our total budget for development cooperation has been earmarked for climate action, including for adaptation. Now, this amount is still not yet what is considered needed by the COP26, 27 stakeholders, but it is still an unprecedented amount of money for this purpose. So for all of us, this creates enormous momentum to act, but we need to do it in the right way. Um, the good news is, is that first generation pilot projects, and uh, we are avid readers of all the project reports that are produced by organizations such as Adelphi, by the um, 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 inputs that we can get from um, Guidon and Ecopeace. 
Um, and some of these pilot projects we have funded ourselves. Um, and all of this gives us proof of concept that when done right, one can achieve noticeable and durable reduction of violence and conflict and amelioration of management of resources. And a quick look at the white paper produced for this conference, which was shared um, earlier today, and I hope you've had a chance to look at it, because it's full of fascinating examples and opportunities for environmental peace building, and it demonstrates the same. Now, and more good news is, is that our delegations um, around the globe are very eager to more intelligently respond to environmental peace building and work with you. But the difficult news is, you felt it coming, is that upscaling these first positive experiences in an accelerated manner, which is necessary, that it takes its time, hitting institutional complexities and ways of doing things that are not yet fit for purpose. Taking nature and ecosystems as a partner in policy responses and program designs requires a new way of working. The entire climate challenge requires a fundamental system overhaul. Now, this is beyond most of us, but no doubt many of you in the room are in positions that have a role to play in feeding the public debate. Now, while that takes place, let me give a few examples of what we in the EU are in the meantime doing at more technical institutional levels that I can oversee. It starts with better organizing our data, translating them and getting them to the right people on the ground. Second, doing the right multidisciplinary analysis um, inspired also, again, by um, examples of Adelphi, but uh, not only, um, and, and doing a bit of it um, by ourselves to, informing program, to inform our programming opportunities on time. Three, developing cross-sectoral collaboration between the peace practitioners and environment uh, practitioners, both at headquarter level, regional, country, and community level. Four, training our staff and enhancing the capacities of our delegations and missions, um, really starting with the ABC, how do we read all, all these participation data? What does it mean for, let's say, our agricultural programming? Five, enhancing our dialogues and partnerships with governments and non-governmental partners at all levels. Um, I can give you a few examples of first project that we funded in Central Asia, um, 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 Africa, uh, mostly in, in, in South Asia, a few. Um, but perhaps it's more interesting to highlight that it's not only happening the first actions on the development cooperation side, but also on the security side, where tremendous progress has been made by the EU climate and defense roadmap, which enables us for the first time to also problematize in our dialogue with member states, the very fact that um, the carbon footprint of military missions and operations needs to be reduced. And we've also started deploying the first environmental security advisors to our mission. Um, let me perhaps end with that, um, 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 going back to development cooperation and the huge momentum that there is. Um, people at the delegations who design and roll out these programs, it isn't that they didn't have a job yet when um, the awareness of climate change and environment and the links with security, let's say, hit the tables and the, our minds. Um, now, but all of a sudden, um, um, they need to add this new dimension to their existing work, which is about inclusive and green growth, governance and human rights, social protection, digitalization, etc. So how our biggest challenge is, um, um, how can we help these people also make it useful for environmental peace building? A lot of work needs to be done there from awareness raising to capacity building prioritization of prevention at operational level and I'm sure each of you wherever you work in your contacts with people representing the EU or our partners can play a role there thank you terrific thank you so much Rika that's it's always um it's always a challenge to figure out with such a big institution with all sorts of pieces how these things come together and so you're knitting that together for us and showing the kind of from big down to the projects is really helpful um, for all of us in understanding both what you're doing and what you'd like to do and how we can be contribute to that in our in our various capacities. Um, so that has um, 
really rich conversation on the diplomatic and the development side. Um, Luis, let's throw it to you and talk about perhaps um, additional actors in the planetary security initiative is engaging to talk about climate security and the kind of responses that are uh, possible and the opportunities for further collaborations as we cast a really wide net with the, the various actors who are critical to um, tackling these problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. And also for me, uh, thanks for inviting and uh, uh, very good to see this big audience and all the uh, familiar faces and, uh, and people we have worked with in the past uh, and hope still to work with in the future and, and continue to work. Um, so the question is really about, you know, what are the opportunities in this agenda and what can we gain from it? And that's sometimes almost for us who work in this field for longer years, you know, is almost stating the obvious. Uh, but for many outside this world, it's still not stating the obvious. Yeah? So the climate security paradigm is still not uh, fully embraced. And it also touches upon, let's say, different ways of working and uh, different programming uh, activities, different budget divisions. Um, but to go back to these questions, of course, if climate impacts are related to root causes of conflict or tensions among groups in society, that's also what needs to be addressed when willing to tackle a conflict when, when doing and peace building or uh, conflict prevention. Uh, and only by addressing these issues also future escalations can be prevented or, or contained. But yeah, the difficulty is usually more let's say, how to do it and also um, the limits of what is possible, yeah, because um, yeah, big uh, adaptation projects, climate adaptation projects, implementing them in conflict-prone uh, territories, countries, uh, states um, with high degrees of fragility, that's just not, you know, an easy uh, undertaking. So, I guess that's very much, you know, the 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 field we find ourselves in. But let's say pointing out that. Uh, there is this relationship and that it also provides opportunities to work on it, I think is, um, is still something that we need to uh, say from time to time. Uh, and also the fact that in some cases it can be a new entry point for dialogue. So ECOP's Middle East, I'm, I'm super glad that Guidon is here. He went to the UN Security Council last week, uh, is doing that already for many years, but there is so many other uh, regions and parts in the world where of course climate change is hitting super hard, but where it has not been previously on agendas uh, uh, that tr try to seek mediation or uh, peace dialogues. Uh, and often these agendas are more about issues that are very sensitive with a lot of emotions and historic grievances and not always the easiest to talk about. Whereas let's say the management of shared resources, uh, land, water, energy, can also be to a certain extent emotional, but you can also in a way sometimes depoliticize it. And climate change is in a way also a new joint enemy that uh, attacks us all. Huh? So these insights, you can see that increasingly people realize, hey, that's powerful. We can use that also in uh, peace building and, and, and conflict prevention uh, processes. And as a result of that, what we've also witnessed at the Planetary Security uh, Initiative is that over the years, so many more uh, local actors, but also representatives of the peace and conflict communities, uh, such as mediators, facilitators of peace dialogues, uh, uh, think tanks in this field, have become interested in this issue and see that uh, something is in there that they could possibly use for their advantage. At the same time, we see also that some of the activities that such organizations are undertaking are taking place under the radar. So they are perhaps less visible, but they are still yeah, ongoing. And of course, for under understandable reasons, they are under the radar because uh, yeah, a lot of the dialogues uh, with whom with, with which you uh, hope to achieve you know, a more peaceful coexistence are not necessarily out in the open or on Twitter or uh, on YouTube. Nevertheless, at the PSI website, the Planetary Security Initiative website, we have tried to make a collection of climate security practices. So we have tried to make an overview of practices that are put in place, like by ECOPs, but also 
uh, by many others, I saw Mercy Corps in here, uh, well, uh, uh, both, let's say, hard security actors as donors, as local actors. And uh, we hope to expand that collection of practices. At this point in time, we didn't dare to, to call them best practices because simply we still have too little information of what works and, and, and uh, what are factors uh, that, that, that guarantee impact or how you could evaluate or measure that. But we hope that our overview can work as a kind of source of inspiration for others, uh, both uh, those who want to set up new climate security practices, but also perhaps, you know, the scholars, the, the PhD students who want to help thinking about how uh, we can learn from these best practices and, and, and how we can scale them up. And I would also like to uh, welcome all of you to, to, to go to this website and to contact us uh, if you know of new uh, climate security practices that we could list or climate security practitioners from whom we could learn who could be interviewed and featured on the, the website. Then at the Planetary Security Initiative, we also try to undertake some let's say, work of our own. Uh, uh, so currently we work with local stakeholders in the south of Iraq, around the Basra area, uh, to consider how climate impacts could be addressed. And we organized a live meeting last year, despite the corona hiccups, we choose a moment where it was possible to go there and to, 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 uh, to organize a meeting on um, a diff, uh, on. Uh, combating deforestation and um, um, yeah, we try to really salt water intrusion and, and the other, let's say, climate related, uh, the climate impact that, that this region is suffering so, so hard from. We also work with local journalists together with our partner Free Press Unlimited and throughout the Middle East, we encourage reporting and storytelling on the climate security links. And in India, we work with the Delhi-based think tank IPCS on analyzing climate security in Southern Asia. And there, I think we still see also the need for, let's say, the awareness raising yeah, that you know you have to do before uh, it's it's understood that also uh, climate security action has to be undertaken. But we just uh, published a big report on the Bay of Bengal region. And also there we see that climate impacts could be used as entry point for dialogue and cooperation. So that's very promising. Well, anyways, I'll stop here. And uh, for the next round, I have probably some more uh, things to say. Great, thank you so much, Louisa. And um, Gabriella, let's, let's turn it to, to, to you as well. Uh, last but not least on this first round, um, we'll, we'll look forward to your insights as well. need to unmute, I'm afraid, Gabriella. Yeah, sure. Um, as always, we forget what is most important to unmute. Um, so hello to everybody. And I'm also very glad to be on this panel. Um, 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 I represent DCAF Center, Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance. And um, um, my organization is um, in fact actually quite new to this conversation around uh, climate security and um, environmental uh, security. Um, DCAP has um, traditionally a mandate for um, helping states and international institutions in terms of security sector reform. Um, and um, up to date, um, these, uh, the work of DCAP has not included um, uh, climate uh, security projects. However, DCAP has increasingly engaged with the topic of uh, climate security and with the um, uh, challenges that cl come from, from climate change and environmental degradation, uh, because uh, we think that um, um, security sector, which is the object of, uh, of uh, work of my organization, also has a, a strong relation to, uh, to, to the way in which climate change impacts security. And um, for the security sector, an increase um, in, in, in the security implications of climate change um, means, in fact, new areas of intervention and an amplification of existing ones. And it also creates a new pressure for um, institutional and operational adaptation to a warming climate. 
Um, for instance, in the case of extreme weather events, um, it requires swift and efficient responses from the security sector, while um, the long-term impact of climate change uh, leading to environmental degradation and to uh, situations of resource scarcity, um, this can create a much more complex uh, uh, security landscape that um, um, often security sector actors are um, asked to address. And we are also aware of the fact that um, very often the security sector itself might be a problem in this equation of climate change and security when they are not, um, <clears throat> they are not subject to good management and, and good governance of security provision. And that's why we think that it's very important for DCAF to develop a new portfolio of work, of projects, of concepts in the field of, uh, of climate security. And, um, and we also think like the other organizations that these new uh, or increasing emerging challenges from climate change um, are also can also be seen as opportunities. Uh, because um, as we know from all previous waves of environmental peace building scholarship and practice, um, having um, or developing a robust governance systems that enable um, resource sharing and cooperation, um, enabling sustainable and fair uh, use and access to resources that are probably scared or, or, or important in a specific region, like water, land, forest, fisheries, and so on. Um, it's a very um, sound way to, to contribute to conflict prevention and sustaining peace. And DCAF has been traditionally part of this conversation about conflict prevention and, and peace building, even though not from, uh, from the perspective of environmental peace building. But we think that DCAF has something uh, to offer and um, would make, um, would make an, an important contribution to this, uh, to this emerging field because it provides a set of norms and uh, institutional arrangements and practices that uh, seek to establish good governance and democratic governance of the security provision. Um, and by integrated environmental and uh, climate uh, change consideration into the mandate and framework of the security sector reform, um, I think that uh, DCAF and the security sector governance and reform paradigm can also contribute to environmental peace building. Uh, so far, we have uh, taken stock of uh, what security sector does in terms of in, in involvement in climate-related security risks, um, at least um, the department to which I belong, policy and research, but DICAF, um, DICAF's other uh, departments are also uh, very keen in developing uh, new projects and programs um, on, on the ground. And uh, also um, another colleague of mine is uh, very active in uh, the field of uh, climate peace and security, uh, climate uh, women, peace and security, the connections between women, uh, peace and security and climate change. Um, but in any case, we have um, uh, observed the notice that the security sector has also positive uh, responses to, to climate security risk in the field of humanitarian and disaster relief in uh, doing ecological restoration in post-conflict contexts, um, in um, combating environmental crimes and through the number of environmental conservation practices. And we are uh, willing to and, and will uh, try to get funding in order to build up in these projects um, and, and these areas, these types of practices in order to bring them into the paradigm of the security sector reform. At the same time, we also think that uh, we need to engage um, and we are trying to, to approach um, organizations, security sector um, organizations, especially the military and also in connection with NATO to, um, to develop a more um, a consistent way of uh, um, reducing their environmental and uh, climate footprint, but also on uh, including climate-related security risks in, in their own uh, strategies and uh, modes of operation and, and um, um, operational frameworks in the long run to, to build up training uh, around these issues. 
And um, so we are in, still in a moment of building up our program in this sense. And, um, and we are also looking for partners and funding in the future ones. Thanks, I will stop it here. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Gabriella. And I um, appreciate uh, the active uh, chat sharing of, of reports and links. There are a couple of questions in there too, so I'd urge the panelists to, to check those out as a preview for our q and I um, appreciate folks uh, starting that um, part of the discussion as well. Um, we're going to throw it back to Gabriella and, and do a reverse order with a second set of, uh, of questions here and then explicitly get into some more of the questions from our participants. But um, for all of you, starting with Gabriella, as awareness and efforts to link climate uh, related security risks and environmental peace building with the aim of developing innovative policies and for sustainable peace, as these are increasing, what should be done to better operationalize climate security practices within programs and projects on the ground in the context that your organization is working and of course work for others as well? And then what are the, are the conditions, mechanisms, actors, levels of action, spaces best suited to enable a positive outcome? So in some ways, where would you particularly focus um, requiring you know, kind of increased attention, but also where we think we have uh, prospects for succeeding? I think we're all um, excited about pilot phase. We're all knowing that we need to go to scale. And so uh, instead of trying everything in equal ways, how do we learn from your experiences so where we can focus uh, with, with the approaches that um, you have seen as, as successful and others can then pick up and try and interrogate and, um, and work with as well? So Gabrielle, if I could throw it back to you. Yes. Uh, so if we talk about the security sector and the security sector governance and the reform area, the main problem I see is that um, there are only very early signs of appropriate climate security tools and practices uh, being developed. Uh, while they are very interesting and laudable first initiatives uh, regarding climate security from coming from some military organizations, especially in, in Western countries or in NATO context, um, all these steps are, in my view, still uh, very theoretical and isolated, isolated examples, and they require increased effort for um, further implementation and operationalization. For instance, very little has been done uh, to exchange best practices uh, among national security sectors, and we also see here a role for DCAF to you know, facilitate that. Um, while at the global level, um, I think only few discussions seek to build or negotiate a multilateral, coherent um, normative and political framework to guide the security sector's um, involvement in climate and environmental security, and especially the military. Um, even though he, when you, um, African Union, OEC are very much keen to uh, build up their expertise in terms of climate security, I think they still um, um, are not giving uh, much attention to the security sector involvement in that conversation. Um, but I think it's very important to develop uh, global climate security norms in relation to the involvement of the climate the security sector, because this will create predictability with regard to how climate change impacts um, also international and conventional areas of uh, security. Um, but it's also important for having an integrated approach that makes uh, efficient and effective use of resources and of mandates um, among um, all types of policy communities that are at work in peace building from security to climate, humanitarian and, and developmental ones. And I think um, action is still very much needed at all levels of the international uh, system of peace building. At the macro global level, um, I think that um, um, security sector reform, even though very much a part of uh, uh, peace building frameworks um, of the UN, for instance, um, are still not connected at all with environmental and uh, climate security mandates or components of the UN uh, 
um, uh, peace operations or of other special political missions. Um, and I think this opportunity of linking them now uh, would, would, uh, would, should be explored in the future. At the state level, um, I think, and hereby again, there is a role for DCAF to play. Uh, the SSR framework itself, as it has been laid down by the UN or, or um, also by DCAF or OEC, um, um, requires a revamping in terms of mainstreaming climate change and environmental um, aspects throughout all um, elements and uh, institutional layers of reform. Uh, because in so far the security sector reform has been has mainly focused on political and technical reform of single security sector actors like military intelligence police in post-conflict situations in transitioning countries um, in failed states um, or on security subsectors like defense prison justice sectors and so on but Climate and environment are not, not at all part of this um, uh, thinking and, and technical um, strategies to, to conduct reform of, of the security sector. And then I think that at the micro level, it is very important for security sector act actors to increasingly start functioning as micro community level actors by in, in this field of climate security by working at the local level with uh, civil society organizations and local communities, because this would uh, very much serve uh, to flag and assess and, and de-escalate tensions um, uh, at an early um, uh, stage and would build very much a trust of civilians in reliable and fair state security provision, um, as well as it would also enable them to, to facilitate a kind of dissemination of environmental and climate security norms that seek to empower individuals and, and local communities. And I think um, having security sector actors doing that would strengthen uh, social cohesion and will help deal better with um, the challenges that come from climate change. And as a kind of a conclusion in general, I think that it's um, beneficial to have uh, climate and environmental uh, considerations into the SSR framework because this would help shaping security sector actors into relevant parts of uh, global and local ecosystems in addition to their uh, traditional understanding as geopolitical actors. And I think that would also have an impact on their own identity as uh, corporate organizations. Thank you. Terrific, thank you, Gabriela. Uh, Luisa, over to, over to you. Yeah, no, thanks. And also thank you, Gabriela, for bringing this so eloquently and, and, and thought through, uh, because I think it's a very, narrow line, you know, the, the role of the uh, security sector in this field. Eh? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, there is not a high likelihood that the military are going to plant the trees or are going to really mediate uh, as diplomats can do uh, among conflicting partners. But in all honesty, without uh, the military providing basic security in very many instances, you cannot do much. Eh? Uh, because there's so many cases in this world where it is also difficult to do things without engaging uh, with the hard security sector. And uh, yeah, that's something we struggle with in this field because traditionally environmentalists are not, you know, the biggest fans of the military to have a more of a pacifistic in route. Uh, but in these uh, security and conflict settings, um, we somehow have to work with the military and you see also an increased interest by the military to to engage but they also struggle with their role and their contribution and also um, uh, with the fact that when becoming more interested in climate security risks also more questions about their own carbon footprint might be asked uh, and um, yeah and uh, I think in the end of the day, they can gain a lot by also tackling that issue. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, there's still work to, do to be done to mature. In general, um, um, because the question is really about, you know, uh, what could be done to better operationalize practices on the grounds and programs and projects. 
Uh, and then I really would like to emphasize again, please consider it, do more, uh, bring projects to scale. Uh, so I'm really pleased, you know, with uh, uh, Mariko Peters' intervention about the EU's role in this. And I also see that the likelihood of this field expanding drastically in the, in the future is going to happen. But we are also still, in a way, sometimes waiting for it. And also, I sometimes complain that it goes too slow, eh? because the current focus in this field is still very much about doing risk assessments. Let's appoint environmental security advisors. Let's develop new policies and set up policy processes. Let's revise the budgets. Let's develop the capability, the capacities and the expertise. But when do you start with actually, you know, uh, turn materializing on that, capitalizing that, sh shifting uh, things on the ground? Uh, but of course, as a as a as a as a think tanker and even an academic, <laughs> I also understand. Let's say that you have to think through and and be good, well prepared. But that being said, sometimes in the past I have felt that climate security sometimes was a bit too much focused on another foresight study, another risk assessment, another. So yeah, there is also this point where you have to say, okay, we never have the full information. We just go for it. And I think in other fields of conflict prevention and peace building, I mean, nobody will say, oh, is it really effective if you uh, uh, collect weapons in a conflict territory for the conflict uh, prevention and peace building efforts? But people will say, oh, but if you do something on water, can we prove that it's effective, you know? So I think um, it's also a change of mindset, perhaps, and also perhaps uh, also, for instance, in the adaptation community where everything is very, you know, technocratic, a lot of engineers to say, well, maybe we can't prove it, but we take the risk that it's going to work or we assume this is going to be beneficial. So we, we give it a try because we're in a situation in this country where otherwise, if it explodes, uh, the situation will be far worse. So I think that's a, uh, uh, that's a point I wanted to make. And then I think also we have to try to uh, get rid of this being too much only in the hands of Western development donors. So it is important uh, to indeed always consider the local ownership uh, and also to engage with diplomats and the defense sector. And unfortunately, that's not only the Western diplomats. I mean, if China and Russia have much leverage in a specific conflict and I don't see or want to see the climate security link, it might also be difficult on the ground to undertake a climate dialogue or to include it in a peace building agenda. So we've, we have to kind of find ways to, to, uh, to work with this. And the same is with the defense sector. I mean, part of the resistance against the defense sector is that in many, many con uh, con conflict circumstances, that's also the bad guys. Yeah, do you talk to the bad guys? Do you engage them? And how would you do it? What if you know the military are the ones that actually um, support the groups that do the illegal logging or uh, 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 monopolize the water resources? So that's very difficult, but in, in a way you can also not completely avoid it. And I think uh, also the things that Gabriela has just said about this uh, difficult relationship and even, you know, secret services or local militia, you might sometimes have to consider uh, in order to 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 make a progress and to do it in an in a way inclusive way. Huh? Um, yeah, so um, that's that would be my plea uh, to um, uh, um, to realize that this is, you know, uh, a, a field that's grown up and that we should hopefully see more in the future. Uh, and also more, maybe sometimes realism uh, in that, yeah, then it also means that you have to work with uh, uh, a bunch of actors where maybe you don't, don't always uh, feel comfortable with and how could, can you do that? What can we learn now from, I don't know, the Sahel where the Europeans or the French are, you know, increasingly <laughs> looked at with uh, caution. So, yeah, how can we... Uh, also continue to consider, for instance, greening the, the Sahel in, in, in such uh, circumstances and how can we go about that. Um, yeah, so just uh, a few thoughts and I hope also to see uh, some interesting questions. I already saw a few, uh, so looking forward to that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, for Gabrielle and Luisa, a couple from Florence in particular on the security, engaging the security side. So um, urge you to check those out and we'll be able to 
have them in discussion, but also urge all the panelists and participants to respond to each other. I just did that uh, really interesting um, question intervention. Uh, Mariko, uh, please, the uh, floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. And I also want to thank Gabriela for these very interesting examples of how in a better world, indeed, the security sector could be your best friend huh? um, 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 to, to help tackle climate security challenges. Um, but it's a long way to go. But if an organization like ICA, DCAF would put its weight behind it to develop such norms, um, that is definitely the way uh, to begin. And so I look forward to that. But I also want to thank Louisa for her very pertinent questions. I'm appreciative of the institutional realities that I'm, um, in, in, I'm, 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 I'm in, but that also um, shape the realities within which many of you can um, 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 roll these agendas out. And yeah, it's true. Um, institutional reform takes time. I remember my days in the World Bank who are very good calculators of any type of governance reform. And they have calculated adding all the data that they have that in a, in a, in a easy uh, business environment, like a country like the Netherlands, it takes about 40, four zero years to do any type of um, sustainable governance reform um, in the security sector. At the time, uh, we were going through police reform and it indeed has taken, if not more than 40 years, a very long time. So. Um, what I want to know is where is the acceleration button? And this goes beyond what we can do at a technical level with an extra study here, there. It, it, it is what I said earlier, is we're talking about systemic change, cultural change, where um, 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 shock therapies, like the effect of a Greta Thunberg or of uh, climate demonstrations, um, 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 cultural changes where all of a sudden even military start talking about climate and where it is no longer something that is only for, let's say, the, the green um, eco-activists. That's the type of change that can accelerate and force institutional reform, which is why um, I'm so happy that we have many of these types of meetings and we will have many more in 2022. Some say it can be a catalytic year towards the next COP. Um, because I think one of the characteristics of the new way of um, um, working climate proof is, is that the governmental and the non-governmental sphere manages to work together in a different way, more trusting, more experimental, like was suggested um, at, 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 at a multi-level. I have already given a few examples of what um, we would need to, 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 to advance on the institutional change. Let me give you a few more. It's um, strategic communication and storytelling. I'm glad that um, 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 somebody was already speaking about storytelling. Was it uh, Guidon or Lucas? Um, it is so, or, uh, uh, or Louise, it is so important to, in, in, in simple language, um, 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 get the stories out there in, in, in the public field. It's rare to have a newspaper article about it that, 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 that makes it apparent yeah, why there is a link and why um, it is an opportunity and why uh, and, and how we are doing something about it. Um, I'd like to also stress the need for clarity on terminology, also important for storytelling. Um, often we talk about climate change, whereas in reality, we talk about much more natural resource management, um, um, environmental degradation, not at all caused by climate change. And this creates a lot of confusion and um, continues um, possibilities for, let's say, uh, people are not yet completely on board to wiggle their way out. So clarity on uh, terminology, and this is, I think, also where academia can definitely help. Um, what we also need um, is uh, translations. So translations from field experiences, translations from um, observations and data into something that we policymakers and the, the budget holders can handle at times when um, 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 we can handle it. Like for instance, when a new budget opens. Now, this may be a bit much to ask, but if we, if we don't find each other in the right place in the right time, speaking the same language, we're, we're going to miss all this massive opportunity. Um, for instance, the EU development programming budgets, the door opens once every seven years. Now, now, now if you know that, it's, 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 it's horrible. Eh? If we don't meet eh, before um, the seven years, uh, there's one way out, they get refined every year. So uh, that's the, the better news. And lastly, I have one plea of what we need going forward. 
Um, we receive a lot of papers, advocacy papers, recommendations, research papers, and, uh, um, um, and, and people come to us to present it, to lobby us, um, advocacy. Um, can you please approach us um, 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 in the new way of working that we need? So not in silos. People typically have meetings with the security people and the peace people and the climate and environment and data people separately, um, but not together. Already the types of conversations that we should be having, I, for instance, I should be sitting here with my development uh, and my security colleague. Um, um, because the climate, peace, security environment challenge is so multidisciplinary, multi-sector, so help us bridge the silos while we are trying to bridge them already ourselves. Thank you. Oh, that's a terrific point, Marika. Thank you so much. It is challenging to do and remember to do because we're so ingrained in the silos, but absolutely practice what we preach, right, in terms of bringing these things together. Thank you so much for that. Uh, get on as somebody has broken down a few silos. You want to share share a few thoughts? Absolutely, and I, I want to break another silo. And I think you know one of the one of the um, challenges that that we've identified uh, in the Middle East, but I think it, it's tr it's truly global, is that you know the, the way uh, the climate convention has worked is that you, know, you you have a responsibility of each nation to to prepare its reports and and its assessments, including on climate and security. And of course, the climate crisis doesn't hit one particular nation. It hits a region in a particular way. And until you know, we promote uh, uh, integrated reports of not just one state, but the interrelationship between all of those states that are impacted in a similar way. So you know, if the Eastern Mediterranean is a climate hotspot, there, there, there is a need for a formal uh, uh, response system that, that, that the countries are not just reporting individually, they need to, of course, but in addition, their needs you know, are under the, uh, 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 either the, um, you know, the climate convention or or uh, I mean, I think that's that 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 is the, the the most appropriate body to to produce reports that respond to the regional impact of the climate crisis, so that that encourages the different uh, countries to think out of the box and and, and to look at the uh, climate security implications not only of their own actions but how their neighbors' actions or failure to act will also impact them and vice versa. And that's how we would uh, start to develop your know, climate and security uh, infrastructure to respond. Um, uh, Cyprus, the president of Cyprus, I think yet to be reported, uh, uh, invited governments from around the Eastern Mediterranean and Middle East for a climate and peace summit today and uh, a great turnout. Um, I, I, I think it's the, it's the first that I've heard of a country simply taking leadership and, and you, know, um, you know, go Cyprus. That is the way that, 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 that we need to be responding. You know, I would like to see more formal requirements of a regional response according to uh, you know, uh, the way that the climate crisis is gonna hit a particular region, um, but but some countries are so concerned and 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 already understanding so deeply that the climate crisis doesn't just hit them. That that to to survive the climate crisis and to really meet the climate and security responses required, we need to work regionally. So so that's um that's that 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 that's one really important call, and we have opportunities. There are. Uh, bodies that are regional that exist but are not focused on climate and security issues so you know in our case in the eastern mediterranean there's the gas forum that that um, was established after finding a great deal of of gas in the eastern mediterranean well you know at, at the un security council at ecopeace we uh, are recommending to increase the mandate to widen the mandate uh, of that Eastern Med Gas Forum 
to an energy and climate security forum. Um, because you know, we, we already have the right uh, uh, governments around the table. I mean, we have nearly all of the governments involved, um, but the, the, the mandate is way too narrow and inappropriate. It's completely siloed. And uh, uh, we need to expand that mandate. And that's our call, um, uh, particularly for Egypt, given that Egypt um, uh, will host the next COP in Sharm. That's an opportunity for Egypt to show leadership and to show the world that, that Egypt is, is taking leadership here and, and willing to call for all of the members of the, of the East Med Gas Forum, which is last century's technology, um, uh, to, to this, this century's urgent needs, and that's climate and security. Um, so, so, so there are real opportunities here as, as we started in, 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 the first ray, in the first round, but we need to break from the silos, as as uh, as Mariko, uh, you know, just so so eloquently uh, stated. I think some of the, you know, the underlying conditions that are always required for us to move forward is is first of all uh, for there to be really an understanding, um, at government level, of the climate crisis and security concerns, at the national and the regional level, and you know. So the role of civil society, the role of academia, the role of, uh, of, uh, of activists is to bring that message home. But until the governments are not uh, uh, in agreement, then, then the conditions are not right. So, so I think we first of all need to you know, uh, raise awareness and uh, put uh, uh, pressure, advocate our various governments to to, to accept that reality. And, and once that knowledge becomes a change in attitude, then we see behavior change. And, and, and to give you the example of, of the uh, you know, Israel-Jordan uh, uh, water energy agreement, when, when we first started, um, uh, we, we also proposed a pilot of a small uh, solar facility to be built in Jordan that would sell for the very first time any electricity, in this case, renewable energy to Israel. But once the governments themselves understood the seriousness of the situation, they didn't want a pilot. They wanted a major investment program, and that's what's happened. Um, so, so that once the conditions are right, and the conditions don't just happen, it's years of advocacy and education, both locally and globally, but it must be locally. You know, uh, you know, from our experience, it's really only Palestinians and Jordanians and Israelis that make the change. The international community can be helpful, at times not helpful, but in the end, it is the local voices that truly impact, uh, you know, government policies and and uh, and uh, uh, you know, understanding that 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 you know, we must invest at the local level to raise those voices to educate. You know, to put pressure uh, on government so that governments can uh, can then take the leadership uh, that's that that's required. Um, so so I, I want to hold it there so that we have lots of times for for answering questions. But I do remain optimistic. Um, maybe I'm a die high. I'm, I'm just a born optimist. But but our experience of 30 years in in perhaps you know the one of the most intractable and uh, and violent. Um, uh, you know, conflict areas is that there is uh, a progress possible on the ground, and and we've witnessed that, um, and we continue to witness that. And the climate crisis, as as much as the challenge that it presents, it is an opportunity because of the urgency um, uh, of the issue to our very survival um, uh, in our part of the world and in, in the globe as a whole. Thank you very much, Gideon. Um, lots of lots of good content reminders there. Lucas, a final word in our kind of <laughs> two sets of around the table, so to speak, around the screen. Yes, thank you, thank you, Jeff. I'll I'll try to keep it uh, super short, so we actually have some time for questions. Um, I mean, I already talked a bit like about the need for thorough analysis, and uh, maybe I'll just add like three smaller points on how to better operational climate security practices, one on programming. And um, for me there, a really interesting question is of how to move beyond 
natural resource management when addressing climate security risks. Um, so I think there's a, this is like one of the best are the areas that's the best developed and um, also building on kind of the environmental peace building experience. And it's, it's a very good entry point to link adaptation and peace building. Um, so not to misunderstand me, but I think there is a need to broaden really the portfolio um, to include all kinds of adaptation measures uh, to actively build peace. Um, and two examples of projects that I've been involved with, or I'm still involved with is like one, um, it's one of those pilot project, um, projects, Mariko um, Peters um, mentioned from, uh, funded by the EU, the uh, UNEP climate security project, for example, that in Nepal uses disaster risk management um, to rebuild relationships between marginalized local population groups and um, the government. So kind of um, using that. And then um, we are currently involved with the uh, um, OSCE in the Western Balkans and the Caucasus to improve transboundary cooperation under really a very broad set of environmental and climate related topics. So anything from air pollution to fire management. And I think there's way more potential to do that. And I think there's also, I think there was mentioned in the chat, somebody mentioned environmental crime. I think that's also an area, there is action on environmental crime, but not the specific link to kind of climate change adaptation and peace building, how that relates back into conflict dynamics. And then also livelihood programming, I think is a, is a huge, huge chunk um, of development assistance. And I think there's way more potential to use that to um, develop specific the climate security portfolio, but also when broadening the portfolio and scaling it up, um, and that's my, my second point, we really need to focus on M&E. Um, so for example, if you have or decide to do a livelihood programming, um, and if you want to have that, um, design that to have climate security impacts, um, or for any really programming um, in the environmental and adaptation topic to have climate security impacts, um, the way the program is implemented becomes very, very important. Um, it starts with a thorough analysis, but it goes also to m &E that you really um, measure your peace building and adaptation and environmental impact. So you need to do both of those. Or if we go back to the livelihood program, if you have a livelihood program that works on climate security issues, it needs to have livelihood indicators. It needs to have an adaptation indicator. It needs to at least have one peace building indicator. And if it doesn't have that, it cannot, it, it, we don't know if it has any impact on, uh, on climate security issues. Um, so yeah, I think that is, is really, really important. Um, and then third and my last point is that um, to do that as well, to build up programming and to build up these institutional structures and all of that, we really need more capacities. Um, and what we've been seeing is like from our side, there is a lot of demand um, for improving capacity. So we've been working with the German Foreign Office um, for the past 10 years to improve their capacities, for example, by giving trainings to young diplomats. Um, we're working with the UN System Staff College on kind of trainings, how to integrate that into conflict analysis. And then with UNEP, we have developed the first free online training course on the to topic. And the first module is online. I'll drop it also in the chat, but I think like this, whole area of training and capacity building is also extremely important. With that, I'd like to hand it over back to you, Jeff. Terrific, thank you so much, Lucas. I think the combination of the last three, Mariko's, yours, and, and Gadon's uh, interventions make it really clear that um, while a easier said than done, it's absolutely essential that we think outside these silos, right? So it is understanding that what is a climate intervention or climate related um, approach is one that, um, and you know, some this requires some uh, kind of modesty and stepping back on our side. It, you don't lead with the word climate per se, right? You can be much more effective in achieving some of these goals, engaging a wider set of actors that are critically important if you don't insist on making it your agenda, right? And finding out what those problems are and then connecting it. Because unfortunately, the scale of the problem means that there, there, there are ways to engage on so many of these issues. Um, and, and, you know, so whether it's thinking outside our, our country focused organization, uh, our sectoral focused organization from, from Gadon and Mariko, these are, these are the things that we have to do. They're not easy, but we have to keep pushing, even if uh, folks will say, but that's not convenient, right? 
uh, unfortunately, don't work, operate in a convenient world. Um, there have been a lot of terrific questions in the chat, and I urge people to continue to put those in there, urge the panelists to, to take a look and respond directly. But I pull out a, a few, and then panelists jump in um, with ones that you want to, to uh, respond to. Um, but uh, there was a, a question about climate finance and some of the challenges there. Gidon, as somebody who has routinely um, spoken to the external funders and made the points that you just did about it needs to be locally driven and it can't be their priority and their organization, what's convenient for them. Um, can you say a word about um, the, the question was kind of uh, climate finance being shy of unsettled situations, right? Conflict settings. Um, I would say it also can be true that there's a kind of facile notion that a one model fits all, and so you don't take account of how things may be different in, in a variety of kind of governance settings and, and conditions. Um, and then again, back to this point, what we define as a climate finance investment um, is, is in itself um, part of the challenge. Can you talk a little bit about some um, some of your experiences, uh, um, uh, hard fought experiences and having those dialogues and, and ways forward? Sure, so, so finance um, is critical, uh, of course, to you know, the operations of, uh, uh, of civil society actors, of, uh, of any actors in this field. And you know, I, I think the biggest uh, problem that, that, that we've always faced is that you know, uh, funders are in it uh, are into programs in the short term. So it's two years, um, four years, if, if you're lucky. We launched the Good Water Neighbors program more than 20 years ago. And, and we've managed to, to get different funders each time to, to uh, finance it, to support it. Without that program, we would not see any of the results that we see today. Um, that, that was foundational. And you know, it was so, it's been so difficult to continue uh, you know, to, to fund that grassroots intervention because it, it, you know, uh, funders are wanting to try something new and, and, and each time it has to be something new and innovative. And, and we're saying, well, it's, it's new and even innovative for the circumstances all the time. We don't need to reinvent the wheel um, if it's working and it's, and, and it's having positive impacts. Um, so so I, I think you know, one thing that's really important on finance is that you know, you, 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 there's need for the long term. I mean, again, Marika you know, said that it took 40 years in, in somewhere like the Netherlands to see changes in policies. So how the hell does someone expect in the middle of a war zone, conflict, animosity and hate you know, within two years, we're supposed to produce, you know, peace and, 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 and happiness and, 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 and resolution. No, that's not possible. Um, so, so there needs to be a much longer term. Um, the, the financing, um, uh, again, also needs to break away from the silo approach. The financing is so much climate, environment, development, humanitarian, as if there is a in complete interaction, um, mm -hmm. particularly in a conflict zone, uh, in all of those uh, endeavors. And you constantly have to you know, design the programming to meet the, the, the needs of the donor rather than the donor you know, coming forward and coming and saying, look, we understand that, that it's complicated, it's complex. So, so we're willing to be flexible um, uh, for the most part um, uh, you know, we struggle to find that. Um, there are some exceptional uh, donors that 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 I think uh, you know go beyond that by uh, instead of funding a, a program, give core support. And and at Equipeace, we're privileged. And, and let me thank Sweden here um, uh, because you know they've come and understood that 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 core support gives tremendous flexibility. Uh, you know, to go beyond uh, a particular silo and, and, and enable you to design programming that touches you know, many of the different uh, uh, you know, critical uh, needs. So just some food for thought. Mm -hmm. 
I'll just give uh, other panelists the opportunity to either weigh in on the finance question, or if you saw a question that was um, kind of well suited for you in the chat that you'd like to weigh in on, just to jump in at this point, because I think there, there's more than we'll get to, and I know the panelists would welcome everyone getting in touch with them so that you can follow up. But uh, Lucas, why don't you go ahead? Right. Thanks. Yeah, maybe just um, something to add on the finance side. I mean, I I totally agree with Gideon that it's we need more kind of financing for integrated projects so that it's not kind of coming out of one silo and it's like it's either adaptation or it's peace building but it is both um and i think there is some good examples of that i think the the peace building fund um the um from the un is like a really good example where they um have as a provision that more than one un agency need they need to work together and have a, a joint theory of change um, which is which brings about like really interesting kind of um, pilot projects, and I think that that is a very interesting approach of how that that could be done. Uh, I think there's also more effort in kind of mainstreaming it into kind of climate financing and other things, but I think there's not enough. And I think that the point that was made in the chat that is really not a lot of climate change adaptation funding going to fragile and conflict affected contexts is really worrisome because those are the most vulnerable contexts in the world. And that's not where the funding is going. So the funding needs to go there. I think there's some big kind of levers that can be put of just putting in some commitments of just saying X percent has to go to conflict and um, affected countries. I mean, that's that's an easy lever. And um, the question then is what happens on the other side? Like, how can we implement that? Um, and of course, there's absorption um, questions. Is like, are those countries actually able to absorb large quantities of, of climate finance and all of those? But I think we need to, we need to scale it up. Um, and I think once we do that, then we just need to make sure that it at least is that a patient money is conflict sensitive, but in the best case, it should be proactively contributing to peace. So if something like the GCF decides to put um, commitments into uh, put X amount of funding into those contexts, then we need like a kind of enabling environment to do that of kind of uh, structures that can support that. And then also some rules of how that is done. Um, um, on the ground. Thanks. Terrific. Thank you, Lucas. Um, uh, Luisa. Yes, I, I also actually wanted this, to make this point about this uh, conflict sensitivity or avoiding mall adaptation, as it's sometimes called. Uh, so, on the one hand, we see a need for more risk taking and also accepting that you can't prove that you've conflicted, that you have prevented a conflict or also that you promoted stability. I mean, it's just very difficult to find theories of change or indicators or results-based frameworks or what have you for that. Uh, but on the other hand, also to seek ways to legitimize uh, funding going to countries where there is a high chance that it ends up in the pockets of maybe not the ones that you want to give it to or to the, you know, that the natural resource management or provisions that you have established go to the groups in society that maybe would not need it or that aggravates inequalities. So that's always the difficulties. And typically in a lot of the academic work, you see a lot of case studies, you know, that that, that showcase this conflict sensitivity, this maladaptation, well, you know about it, Jeff. Um, uh, but yeah, let's try to find ways to showcase that it can also be done differently, but also accept maybe that yeah, there is some risk taking uh, element in, 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 in the funding field. And again, you know, that for other conflict and peace building efforts, maybe this rigid justification is less, you know, uh, so more is assumed to work. So maybe we should also do that a little bit more in this or, or dare to do it a little bit more in this field. Okay, I'll stop here. Mariko, oh, get it, sorry. I see you've unmuted, Mariko. Would you like to jump in? Yeah, perhaps just to add, also aware that we're almost nearing the end of our time together. Um, I'm really enjoying this conversation. I'm taking so many notes um, um, of, of, of things I'd like to follow up on with with, with, what have, with that have been said. Um, and the, 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 some of the funding suggestions, the, 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 the way of working, the regional approach, uh, more ideas for how to cross society. So many thanks um, for that. Um, perhaps a last observation is, um, 
I, I don't know how many of you have been at COP26 in Glasgow, but reports that I get back from people who have been is, is that the, the climate and security topic, it was scattered, it was not a strong message. It was a sideshow, if a show at all. Um, and we were also part of that. Um, so I hope there's a, that, that there is movement and dynamic. I'd like to hear about it um, um, towards COP27. If it's going to be about justice, it's bound to be about climate and security. So where, where's the big bang that can be made for this topic, this, this, this waking up of politicians like Guidon is saying, can it, can it happen there? Is, is a year enough? Have, have people started working? I'd like to know, and if anything I can do to help in that year, um, I'd be happy to. Terrific, yes, We're looking for that big bang. That's a, a good way to give us, give us the charge for sure. Uh, Gabriella, as we're, as we're concluding, any final thoughts from you? Um, yeah, so I, 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 I think it's a difficult conversation uh, because securitizing climate change, it always comes with uh, threats or, or pitfalls. And uh, we working in the security sector are very much aware of that. But we have to use uh, climate change to make changes that are good for our future. And in that sense, I will also connect to two of the questions that or comments that were made in the chat, one by Florence Foster that uh, points out that uh, military emissions, for instance, are not calculated uh, in the IPCC um, assessments of climate change and uh, climate warming. And, for me, that's, uh, for instance, a kind of uh, example where the need for global negotiation in bringing the military into that conversation is, is, is very important and we, we should uh, push for that. <laughs> and, um, and the second comment that was uh, raised up in the chat was that the question of uh, climate security is not only something for emerging, countries, emerging powers or poor countries in the global south, but it's also something that um, um, that that is of interest for uh, developed democratic, liberal democratic countries. And we have to be also attentive to that dimension of building up governance uh, in climate security, also in relation to the security sector, because we've learned lessons from the pandemic time. <laughs> where security sector uh, forces sometimes overstep the mandates or, yeah. So I think that's a very good comment. I totally agree with it. Thank you. And I'm happy to have been part of this conversation. It was great. Yeah, likewise. No, it's been an excellent conversation and uh, very informative. Uh, as, we, as we knew going in, we had a diverse set of experiences and, um, and that translated into a variety of uh, lessons learned, suggestions for the future, problem identification, but also some, some examples of where we've overcome some of them, even if they're still in pilot and we'd love for them to go to scale and love to break out of the bounds of the single state, the single sector, um, and um, how we define these problems. So I think you've given us uh, a, a great deal to work with. Um, this session will be, um, has been recorded and will be archived. And then um, also there'll be a meeting report that will include insights from this that come out of the conference. And then of course, we urge you all uh, participants to keep connecting with one another, to reach out to the panelists for follow-ups because um, there's a lot of great stuff there in the in the chat, and we know um, it's really uh, all of us who have to kind of come to the table and, and, and make a difference on these issues, given the scale and the importance of them. So thank you all very much on behalf of the Environmental Peacebuilding Association. I really appreciate the panelists uh, sharing their time and insights and all those who have attended and certainly the folks who um, we didn't see because there wasn't problems because the technical support folks were so good. Thank you to them for making this happen and going off without a hitch. Um, and so thanks so much and uh, see you all, uh, hopefully at another Environmental Peace Building Association panel this week. Great, thank you, bye. Yeah, great. Thank bye -bye. you, bye, bye.